Hi everyone, welcome to Just and Unwind, where we just, we unwind, and we have fun in the process. Um, we are going to Istanbul today, uh, and my name is Nanya, if you didn't know that already. But today we are going to go to Istanbul. About two months ago, I left a Facebook status, and I asked my friends to leave me recommendations on places to travel or to see while I would be in Istanbul. And... Um, a few people left me recommendations, and to those people, I say thank you. I really appreciate it, um, I, and I did to put those into consideration while I was in Istanbul, and I checked some of those spots out. I will talk to you more about it. Um, so, but before I continue, before we actually start the show, I think it's important that I mention to you that I actually have never been to Istanbul. <laughs> I've actually never been there in person, um, but I've been there mentally in my mind. Um, so if we go back even a couple more years ago, I was in my parents' house in Irvine, Texas. I was just daydreaming. This was before social media was really prevalent. So people actually daydreamed at that time. I, myself, you know, took some time to, people actually got a chance to be really bored as opposed to. Um, just getting on social media and immediately getting entertained by whatever is happening or just being on the internet. So I was in my room, I was daydreaming, thinking of all these places that I wish I could go see. And I knew I couldn't go because one, the funds weren't really there. And two, um, I didn't really have the time to travel like I wanted to. So um, I knew I wouldn't be able to make the trips in person, but then again, I thought to myself, okay, I might not be able to get there now, but there's nothing that is stopping me from exploring these places mentally. And what that entails is um, researching about the area, finding out as much as I can, reading up on the culture, the people, um, the landscape, just everything I can about the, the, the politics, just reading up on that area and just being there without actually going there. And that's when this idea of mentally going to places uh, came about. So um, that's what this this uh, episode is about. I went to quote unquote Istanbul, <laughs> but I didn't go. But I'm going to talk to you about it. And um, I actually encourage you to try this out for yourself. I think it's something that you're going to enjoy. And let me tell you some of the advantages of this mental journey and mental travel. And my hope is that not only do you come back and listen to me and um, hear more about my adventures, but that you also take these adventures for yourself. Um, so the advantages are number one, you know, there are no restrictions. You could do whatever you want to do and you're going to find out because, for example, I'm going to fly first class on <laughs> I'm going to fly first class to Istanbul because I can, you know. So if you can just allow yourself the freedom to be um, to be a kid with your imagination and just be free and creative, you could do whatever you want to do on this trip. And it's fun. There are no restrictions money wise. There are no restrictions time wise that you don't have to ask for a vacation um, or you don't have to worry about who's going to watch your children. You could do that. You could do whatever you want to do. And also, even if you had those things situated, like you had the money and the time to travel, there are places that you might want to visit that it's not advisable to go to. For example, if there is any kind of, um, 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 let's say, a disease outbreak, if there's war, if the political or weather climate is not really favorable, then it might not be your, in your best interest to visit there at the time. And so if this, these things would actually hinder you if you are trying to physically go somewhere, but if anything, they enhance this little project that we're doing here because it makes it more interesting. That just becomes another angle to explore in your mental journey. Um, if it's a political strife, in the area, you could explore that. You could read about that, find out what, um, how it came to be, what it feels like. Imagine what it feels like. Even though you might not be able to be there, you can try to empathize with the, with the citizens and the people who live there and try to just figure, imagine what it would be like if you were there. Um, so that's one of the advantages. Another advantage that I like for me, this may not 
per- pertain to you, but I don't like um, the tourist crowd in any places that I go visit or any anything really. Um, I like to, when I explore a new place, I like to be like a fly on the wall. I like to just imagine that place in its natural ecosystem. And I find that when you have thousands of um, tourists just walking through an area, foreigners, then it feels to me that it dis- uh, it disturbs the natural ecosystem. It disturbs the natural vibe. I don't feel like I get a good sense of what it, it's, it's like to be there. Um, I'm actually what I'm witnessing is now, um, a different ecosystem, the ecosystem that involves all the foreigners and all the tourists from all over the world. And I personally don't want that to be a part of my trip. Now I know that you can't avoid it in this day and age. That's fine. But, you know, I think that's an added advantage of this mental, this is my mental journeys. I'm really, really hoping that you actually give this a try and tell me how it goes and tell me um, where you go and um, I would I might check it out you know I might check it out and or yeah I might check it out so please share with me and then the last last uh, advantage is that this is just fun it's it's fun <laughs> it's I can't it's fun it's fun it, and it's a good fun it's a productive fun a lot of times the things that we do for fun sometimes are not so productive you know it's it has no utility per se but this is a fun way to pass time you learn about the area you meet new people you get to know different languages, different culture, the cuisine. Um, You know, you just, for example, like when I go to these mental journeys, I actually try out a cuisine, like um, I'll look up um, recipes online and then I'll pick one that I like and I try it out in my house and I I just eat it. Why not? For this trip, I tried out the palif, I don't know how to say it, it's P-A-L-I-F, palif, palif, It's a rice dish. Um, It was actually good. My husband liked it. Um, So anyway, so and take these trips with me. They're fun, 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 fun. So without much further ado, let us go to Istanbul. Why did I choose Istanbul? Why not? You know, I wanted to pick somewhere that is not um, your typical places for someone that is looking for some somewhere to vacation to go to. A typical place to me would be somewhere like Paris, London, Spain, maybe Australia. These, you know, that these are generally the typical places I would imagine. I wanted to try something different. Unbeknownst to me, Istanbul is actually one of the more uh visited or yeah, it's like I feel like one of the statistics I checked, it was like number eight in the world in cities that tourists visited. So I didn't know it actually got that much traffic, but that's fine. It can get as much traffic as we want, as it wants. If you know, it's, we're not going there in the physical, so it's okay. So what's interesting and cool about Istanbul is that it is located. um, It's one of the few cities that is on two continents. It is in Europe and and it's in Asia. Both sides of it is separated by a strait. A strait is a narrow body of water that separates two uh, lands or two land masses. So there's two straits that separate the European side from the Asian side. I can hear my baby crying. I hope my husband is not coming up here with this baby. (laughs) They better let me record. Okay, so yes, there's the the two straits, one is the Bosphorus and one is the Dardanelle, Dardanelle. I don't know how that is pronounced, but there's two straits. And um, on one, the left side, you have your European side. On the other side is your Asian side. I find that most tourist activities is on the European side. And I think that that's just where people chose to um the people who have lived in this area just for some reason they preferred that side i don't know why you know so a lot of things that were done throughout history happened to have been done on that side so as a result all these places to go check out they tend to be on that side i'm this is what i'm thinking you know i i don't really know why but i i'm assuming you know because the roman empires that's where they set up their uh camp the roman so 
originally uh, the Roman Empire took over this area from the the locals that were there uh, when they conquered it and added it into the Roman Empire. The the emperor that did this was Septimus Severus. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. So he conquered it, and now that place now became part of the Roman Empire. About two centuries later, it slowly but surely changed now from a Roman Empire to a Byzantium Empire, which is more of an East Roman Empire. And this was done, started by uh, the Emperor Constantine I. Um, He's interesting because he was the first Christian Roman Emperor, and he's actually credited with helping Christianity spread in that area because wherever he would defeat in wars at the time, of course, he'll bring Christianity into the place. And so that's what happened. He, you know, he made, um, he left Christian, um, Christian footprints in this area. Like he built a lot of churches. Um, and, um, interestingly enough, right now, when you go there, they're not that much physical relics of this time when the Roman empires were there. What you find more is the Ottoman Empire, which was the last reigning empire that was there. Um, The Ottoman Empire, they were coming from the east. So they were coming from the Asian side while the, uh, the Roman Empire, Constantine's empire was still, you know, was still reigning on the European side of Istanbul. And, but throughout history, you know, the natural and man-made wear and tear was taking its toll on the city. They had had a plague, wars. So it wasn't quite that strong. Meanwhile, on the, their neighbors to the right, that, that where there was an empire building up there, which is the, Tur- the Turkish or Ottoman Empire. It was building up there, getting stronger. And eventually it conquered um, the other side and now made that part part of the Ottoman Empire. And the interesting thing is whenever people take over that land, they tend to go there now and set up camp and decide to govern from there. When Constantine became emperor, he decided to make this area the new Rome and shift his, you know, his governing um, center from Rome to Constantinople. Well, I'm calling it Constantinople because that's the name that it was changed to. But it's the same place as Istanbul. He moved his uh, government over there and tried to recreate a new Rome. Because apparently um, Istanbul has seven hills, much like the old Rome. So he really tried to make this place the new Rome. Same thing with uh, the Ottoman Empire. When they took over this place, they now started governing from this area. So there must be something really, really attractive, either naturally beautiful, either the place is either naturally beautiful or attractive, or it offers um, uh, an advantage when it comes to fortifying. um, It's a fortified place when it comes to war and military endeavors. So again, that's why I say like most activities tend to be in that European side of Istanbul, even like I said, even though the Turkish were coming from the Asian side, you know, most of their palaces seem to be on that European side. Uh, And I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, when it comes to the two straits, most of the activity also is on the Bosphorus Strait. If you remember, I said that there's two uh, straits that are separating both sides of the both continents um, the, the both sides of the city that is on the two continents. And again, all the activity is on the Bosphorus as opposed to the Dardanelles. So I wonder again, there must be something interesting and attractive about being on the Bosphorus side and on the European side. I can only imagine if you've actually been there and explored both sides, let me know what, what's the vibe, what's the difference, or if you can think of what you think might be what might have made that place more attractive or if I'm even, you know, off and don't know what I'm talking about, please let me know. You know, I'm not an authority on anything I say because I didn't actually physically go there. So anyway, um, that is kind of a brief history on, um, this area. Now, like I told you when Constantine, 
uh, took over and made that his new Rome. As the first Christian, he built lots of churches in this area. But I told you also that there are not that much relics left from their time, for the time that they were uh, in in office. What you see mostly is the Ottoman empires. And what happened is when the Ottoman empire came and took over, they actually converted all the churches, or if not, let me know. I don't know if they did all, but at least most of the churches that were built by the Byzantium people, he, he they changed them all to mosques. And one of them, not one of them, several of them, you could still go check out. Now, the most popular one that you will see is the Hagia Sophia. Um, that is one of the popular tourist spots to visit. It used to be a mosque. If I actually, the church was built on uh, where a pagan temple was. Constantine ordered the church to be built and it was built on the site of a pagan temple. And then, so they built the church. It's been through so many fires, um, earthquake, just natural and man-made wear and tear. And then when the Ottoman Empire came, the Sultan at the time, I believe his name was Mehmed, ordered that church to be converted to a mosque. So they built uh, the minarets and they changed it to um, they changed it to a mosque. And so that's what happened with a lot of the churches that were there already. It was changed to mosque. And actually they used that to um, entice people to move to the area because when they conquered that place, you know, I, I imagine from what I've read, that it was very barren. There wasn't much going on. So to repopulate the area, they would build, they build structures like this, like the mosques. And I believe the Grand Bazaar, which I'm also going to talk to you about, was also, you know, an effort to, you know, entice people to come back into the area. So um, that's just a brief, let me make sure I've covered everything that I want to talk to you about when it comes to, um, just a brief history of the area. Um, so now how are we going to get there? I'm going to be traveling from Houston, Texas to this Istanbul. Um, I will be flying Lufthansa. And like I've mentioned earlier, I will be flying first class. And this is because I can do that. <laughs> um, you could do that too. If you choose to go with me, you could fly first class with, with me. Um, let me tell you, my flight is going to be from from Houston to Frankfurt, um, it's going to be about 10 hours, nine hours and 45 minutes. And then from Frankfurt to Istanbul is two hours and 55 minutes. So roughly three hours. My ticket price is, I'm going to round up, it's $10,400. Now I don't have a problem making that payment you know, in this mode of travel, but I do just, I'm curious as to who out here is really paying $10,000 to fly anywhere. Like for real, <laughs> I'm just imagining like how much money do I need to have to feel comfortable spending $10,000 on a ticket to go anywhere? When I don't have to spend that much, I could pay the regular price in tick in coach, which I believe is about a thousand and maybe thirteen hundred dollars. Um, I could pay that price. I'm gonna get there the same time as the people in first class. So what is the, what's the appeal? Like, I get the obvious appeal. It's nicer, and you have more room. But is that really worth ten thousand dollars? Like an extra nine thousand dollars? Is that I don't know that it's worth it. Like, is the menu really that much different and better than what is served in regular coach? Anyway, that's left for the people who are actually uh, making decisions on whether to pay this price or not. For us, we don't have to worry about it. We could just charge it to our mental credit cards, honey. There is no limits and we don't got to make payments. So just charge it to the credit card and we'll, we'll be on our way. <laughs> and then, of course, when I get there, we have to talk about accommodation. Where are we going to stay? Of course, there's hotels everywhere. I would like to stay on the Bosphorus and have a nice view of that uh, body of water. Um, and so I decided to stay at this hotel called the Surrogate Palace. I chose it because it was actually an old palace of one of the sultans of the 
Ottoman Empire. Um, they used to, at that time, the sultans who were the rulers would build a palace for themselves. So this was actually one of the last palaces that was built. And it was built on this Bosphorus Strait. And I can just imagine, life must have been really good <laughs> for the sultan, his girl, whoever was around his children to be living on the palace on the Bosphorus Strait. I can just imagine. It must have been really beautiful. Just you can imagine how I'm if I'm trailing enough is because my mind is I'm taking my mind to what that area would have been like. I'm imagining a lot of green like forests. Um, it's hilly. There, there are seven hills in that area. So I'm imagining a really beautiful uh, landscape with all the hills and then the blue water because you don't have all the. Uh, pollution from all the people traveling over there um it's just a beautiful beautiful it's 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 beautiful s picture in my head that it's that i'm painting but it's not like that now i don't think it is but i can imagine that it is but it's not like that um but i'm gonna stay at the surrogate palace i am choosing their two-bedroom suite it's called a two-bedroom corner palace suite i believe and um, for six nights, because I'm going to be leaving July 1st, I'll get there July 2nd. I'll stay all the way to July 7th. I leave July 7th and um, get back to Houston July 8th. So that is two, three, four, five, six, seven. So no, that's actually five nights that I'll be there. And for five nights and staying in this two bedroom suite that I'm choosing, uh, my bill is going to be $41,000. Yes. I said my bill is going to be $41,000 in case you didn't hear me the first time. <laughs> oh, but thanks to our mental credit card, honey, we could just charge it and keep it moving. I'm not even going to wonder who's staying here um, paying that amount of money. But it's, I think it's only fitting that we stay in such a place because when I think of um, that Ottoman Empire, when I think of that Mediterranean culture, I think of like opulence, I think decadence, indulgence, just rich, just enjoying, luxuriating. And how can you, the only place you could do that is in the palace. So that's why I'm choosing to stay there and to stay in one of their more expensive rooms. There are cheaper rooms for people who actually want to physically go there and may not want to spend $41,000. I can understand that. I wouldn't hold that against you. Um, but if you want to stay there, I did see rooms as cheap as $370 a night. It's still expensive, but um, I guess it's not. <laughs> I guess it's much. Even at $370, if you stay 10 nights, you know, you spend 3700 bucks, give or take. So not quite 41000 but whatever. And transportation, they have taxis, they have railroads. I would actually prefer like walking as much as I can. I wouldn't want to rent cars, although I do think that is available. But I'd rather, um, you know, w with these mental journeys, you, I imagine, like time is not a factor. So I, I would like to take my time doing things. And it's not only that time is not a factor. Um, um, physical, like physical limitations of your body is also not a factor as well. So if I want to walk, I enjoy walks. So if I want to walk from one place to another, um, I could do that. <laughs> I can, I could do it. I can do that. I can do whatever I want. I quick story. Ugh, I don't like it when I, um, ramble, but I used to walk a lot. Uh, when I was in pharmacy school, I used to walk from school to my house um, instead of t taking the bus. Well, I would normally take the bus, but what would happen is while I was wait waiting for the bus to get to the bus stop, I'll check my time. And if I had enough time to walk to the next bus stop before the bus gets to me, I'll start walking to the next bus stop. And I'll do that, do that, do that until I get to a point that I'm like, what's the point of getting on the bus? I'm already close to home. I might as well just keep on walking. So anyway, that's just a, a side story, but I enjoy walking. I do. Even when it's hot, I prefer that. I like it. No, I don't mean I prefer walking in the heat. I just prefer walking, even if it's hot. Um, okay. So the places that we, I would like us to, to hit while we're here, um, 
the first place I would like to see is the Grand Bazaar. Bazaar means market. So it's a big old market. And I imagine it to be like the markets we have in Nigeria. I'm imagining Obwete, which just streets of vendors selling different items. And then maybe, you know, in a particular section of the market, um, you have more like a theme or like a group of items that go together. Like, for example, th you come to a section, they, they sell fabrics and maybe not too far from where they sell fabrics, you see some tailors and then, um, you know, just things are kind of grouped together. That's how I imagine it. I don't know if it's like that. If it's like that, let me know. If you've actually been to Grand, the Grand Bazaar, let me know. But I would like to go there because I think a market gives you a good feeling of what... Um, of the culture you get to see what they have what they're selling you people that you see people interacting in their natural way um and speaking their language and i would just take my time and peruse through the through the the street and look for things and not nothing in particular just things that will catch my interest um i would probably buy tea because apparently tea is a big part of the Turkish culture. If you're over there and somebody asks you to have tea with him, it's actually, from what I'm reading, it's kind of rude to to say no. You know, if you if you're gonna say no, find some diplomatic way to to turn it down because having tea it, it is. You know, just having tea, is a, I think it's just so, it's a big part of their culture, like having tea with each other. And they have this, oh gosh, I wish I knew the name. They have a, the, the, their tea cup. It looks interesting. It's not a, your regular tea cup. And there's a name for it. I used to know it. I don't, I don't know the name anymore, but I would try to buy some tea at the Grand Bazaar and I'll just buy just anything that, I, I don't want to buy your typical touristy things. <laughs> like if they're selling openers, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> or shot glasses. <laughs> you know, those typical tourist things or postcards. Um, I would try to see what I know that I'm not going to be able to get anywhere else except for here. And so I don't have anything in mind. There's nothing that I'm looking for in particular except just to be there and watch and be a fly on the wall, like I said. From there, I would like to go check out the Spice Bazaar. This is another market where they sell spices. Apparently, they can even mix up and make your spices for you. Two spices I'll be checking out in particular. I'll buy other spices too, but I'll be looking out for uh, their meat spices. I thought that sounded very interesting. I've never... Um, had a meat spice. If you have, let me know. Maybe I'm, I, I was late to the culinary thing. You know, I'm just now exploring my culinary side and I'm enjoying myself. Um, but I would like to, to add some meat spices to my, uh, spice collection. I think that would really enhance some of the meals that I make and they can make it for you on the spot. Like they can custom make it however you, way you want it. And then the other thing that we're going to check out is the saffron spice. This is one that is a hot ticket when it, when you're in Turkey, apparently it's a big deal. It's one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive spice. Um, it's almost worth its weight in gold. So if you go there and somebody offers you something really cheap, calling it a saffron, um, as the turkey saffron, then they're probably not selling you the real deal. And apparently this is a thing where people sell people this uh, fake saffron that is not the real thing. Um, if you want to buy the real thing, they advise you to buy the Iranian saffron because that's where most of the saffron that is made now it, it's imported from saffron into Turkey. It's from saffron. It's imported from Iran into Turkey. And it's more reddish. It has a reddish hue, while the other Turkey uh, saffron looks a little bit more orange. So I would like to check that out. I would like to buy it just for, you know, to fulfill all righteousness. But I was researching on what it tastes like, and I'm not sure I would like this saffron business. Um... It is supposedly, it tastes like, somebody described it as tasting like a metallic honey. Um, so, <laughs> when, so when I try to picture that, I think of honey, of, co of course. And then I think of, um, to get the metallic taste, I think of, um, I think of blood. <laughs> I think of blood. And then I think of 
pennies and um, mixed with um, honey. I'm just, my face is all frowning up now because I, it just doesn't, it doesn't, blood, honey and pennies just don't seem like they will make the best tasting combination. But I will give it a try. I'll give it a try. It's actually made from the stigma of the flower. And that's part of the reason why it's expensive. It's difficult to make and it's time consuming to make. And saffron was actually mentioned in the Bible in Socks of Solomon chapter 4 verses 14 where, um, let me open that up real quick. I should have had it opened already. But bear with me. I might edit this part out. If I want to edit it out, then I should be completely silent. It makes it easier to edit out later on. I still haven't found it in my bed. When you find it, say amen. <laughs> Whoever is opening it right now, when you find it, say amen and read it out loud to the congregation. Socks of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 14. And it reads, uh, let me start from 13. This is, I believe, um, this chapter is entitled, it is entitled, Solomon Admires His Bride's Beauty. So he's writing about how beautiful his uh, bride is and he says your shoots this is chapter 13 verse 13 your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits henna with nard nard and saffron calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense myrrh and aloes with all choice spices chapter verse 15 a garden fountain a well of living water and flowing streams from lebanon so it's mentioned in the Bible. So that's enough reason for us to check it out. If Solomon is comparing his wife's, you know, his bride's beauty to saffron, it's, it might be in our best interest to see what the saffron is like. <laughs> so we're going to check it out. So we've spent enough time in these markets. Let's try other things. Let's move on, move on, move on to, we are going to go to, uh, the Haggai, the Hagia Sophie, like I told you guys, that used to be, um, the site used to be a pagan temple. Then it was, they built a church on there. And then from the church, they built the, the, when the Ottoman empire took over, they converted it into a mosque. So I would like to check that out. Um, when they converted into the mosque, they built the minarets, which are those four, the, the slender long structures that you see, um, at, on, on mosques that's where for people who are not um for my non-muslim listeners that that minaret those long uh the long slender part of the the mosque is where the muezzin climbs up to call the people for prayer and he does this five times a day to call them for prayers um i think in this day and age now they don't really climb i think they just put a speaker up there and it projects from that minaret. But that was a lot of work, climbing up that minaret five times a day. That's That, that ain't easy. I'm sure those muezzins were really, really fit. So um, so he the they switched, the, they turned the Hagia Sophia into a mosque, erected those minarets. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things about this place is its minarets don't actually ma match. There are three different kinds. There are four minarets, but two match, and then the other two are different. And I guess they were constructed at different times. They were added to the buildings at different times. And also interesting thing is that um, the depending on the number of... You can tell the status or the stature of a mosque by the number of minarets it has. The more important mosques tend to have more minarets. Or if it was endowed by a sultan, it will have four minarets. Um, other ones will have like two or one. So that's, it's just, just an interesting fact. So I would like to check that Hagia Sophie out and see what it's about. Um, but the other, the mosque I'm really, really interested in seeing is the Suleiman Mosque. This was built in 1550. It was, they started building it, building it in 1550 and completed construction in 1557. Apparently the the architect who designed this is one of the most famous architects of that time and he 
built some beautiful edifices and I would like to check this one out because I think I'm a fan of excellence and I'm a, far, a, a fan of art. And when I see a lot of these mosques that were built in this time frame, they just exude such poetic beauty. It's just, it's so beautiful. And I would like to check it out in person. And this architect was actually, um, his tomb is in that mosque. So that's interesting. Uh, this one, it's Minaret's match. And then also the Sultan that shares its name with this mosque is actually, so people think of him as, um, you know, the second Solomon, you know, Solomon is, you know, in the Bible as well as in the Quran. And actually he was named after the Solomon in the Quran and Solomon as we all know, was a very wise leader and his people flourished at the time that he was on the throne. Likewise, this, this Sultan, he, the time that he was a Sultan seemed to be when, um, that Ottoman empire really, really flourished. In fact, I believe posthumously, or maybe he was still alive at the time. They started calling him the the Europeans started calling him Solomon the Great because, oh no, Solomon, the, Suleiman the Magnificent, because he was really, really thriving. His people were thriving, thriving while he was governing, much like Solomon of the Bible. So it's interesting. And they, they have lots of connection. And I think there is even something about this mosque. I, I believe it's the dome or something about it that tries to, you know, draw on these comparisons between him and um, the wise Solomon in the Bible and in the Quran as well. So that's two places that we set the second mosque. The third mosque I would go again. This one is just to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah, all righteousness because I don't know. I'm more interested in the first two I said, but the blue mosque is really popular. It's called the blue mosque because the insides of it is, uh, it's decorated in blue tiles. So it has this blue hue to it. So I would like to check the blue mosque out. The interesting about blue mosque is that it has six minarets, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, very, um, unprecedented. And still there are not lots of mosques that have that amount of minarets. So apparently it's supposedly may have been a mistake. The Sultan that called for it, rumor has it that he wanted gold minarets but the person that who was constructing it mistook him to mean six minarets and hence we have the six minarets but it's it's beautiful still all those mosques are really really beautiful when really the mediterranean um culture is it's it's very beautiful um so all of them are worth uh, checking out. And then, of course, like I told you, we're going to check the cuisine. I already tried the cuisine in my house. You could do some research and um, look up different types of um, um, recipes that you would like to try out. I did that. I told you guys I tried the palif. And it, palif, palif, I don't know how to say it, but it was really tasty. Um, I think I've kept you long enough. Let us get on home, get on our first uh, flight home. Uh, from our Saragam Palace and held on back to wherever we're coming from. I'm going back to Houston, Texas, and I'm going to plan my next trip. I'll let you guys know where we're going next or where I'm going next. And I hope you come along with me. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. Bye.